Uh, well, I hope you are all buckled in. We are about to have a very cozy fireside chat this morning on memory safety. Uh, memory safety vulnerability is a critical issue. Um, and I'm really excited to be here today to moderate this panel and talk about it. My name is Amira Dalla, and I work at Consumer Reports. That has nothing to do with Consumer Reports. I just got really excited about the fire coming on the screen. <laughs> it's like, yes, this is the coziness that I've been talking about. Um, yeah, I'm, and I'm really excited to talk about memory safety today uh, because it is such a critical issue. But you don't have to take my word for it because I have data. Recent study found that 60 to 70% of vulnerabilities in iOS and Mac OS are memory safety vulnerabilities. Microsoft estimates that 70% of all vulnerabilities in their product over the last decade have been memory safety issues. And Google estimated that 90% of Android vulnerabilities are memory safety. And so it is a really critical issue. And with the rise of bad actors and figuring out how we're going to secure our products, our tools, and our services, it's ever more a critical time with private and public pressure to switch to memory safe languages. Uh, and not only that, um, there is just a lot of challenges that have kept coming up over the last few years as we've been talking about this. And today, we're going to talk about those challenges with our panelists. Uh, and I'd love for them to introduce themselves. So if you all would just do your name, your org or affiliation, and what brings you to the conversation on memory safety. Oh, sorry. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Yael, and I work for Consumer Reports on Security Planner. Um, and I started thinking about memory safety, um, I think from reading Alex's blog, actually. <laughs> um, and I was looking at the number of vulnerabilities, and I'm like, this sounds really high, and just kind of pulling on that string. Um, and then at the same time, um, my background is in investigative journalism, and so, you know, like we're all terrified of Pegasus. And I had a friend who was helping me figure out if I had Pegasus on my phone or not. And, um, you know, I didn't, which was great. But um, I remember we were talking about it, and um, they said, well, until there's memory safety, we can't really do a whole lot about all the Pegasuses we don't know about to, like, lower that risk. Um, and so working on Security Planner, we give people a lot of tips on how to be more secure online. And so it's really frustrating to me that we can't tell people these are behaviors that you need to do to protect yourself here, or um, these are tools that you need to buy, because there's like nothing you can do, and it requires a more systemic change. And so that's kind of how I came on board. Hey, uh, I'm Alex. I work for the Federal Trade Commission, though I'm not here uh, representing the commission this morning. Uh, and I came to memory safety. Uh, I was academically kind of like interested in the topic. Like, oh, it seems important, fewer vulnerabilities. And then around 2016, 2017, I got involved in doing fuzzing and security research on some open source projects. And kind of at the time I started that effort, it was like, oh, these are widely used open source projects, TLS library, image parser. like. I'm not the first one to this table. Like maybe I'll find something, but you know this this is not going to be, you know, a, a serious, you know, high vulnerability count. And then the just vulnerabilities just started like fall, falling out the bottom of it. Like there was no tomorrow. And kind of at th this point, that fuzzing like campaign is racked up. It, it's in the hundreds, if not close to a thousand findings. And just kind of the flood of emails that started coming in of like. Fuzzer found this buffer overflow. Fuzzer found this uninitialized variable. Fuzzer found this use after free was kind of radicalizing, particularly when I saw that the developers, like fixing this was it, trying to engage seriously with the number of these vulnerabilities and like fix all of them and treat them all responsibly and you know get a CVE for all of them. It was like burnout inducing, like trying to take seriously the, this number of vulnerabilities was like not realistic. And like that was radicalizing. Like, oh, we need to do something totally different. Like, we can't fix our, we can't find the vulnerabilities or fix our way out of this problem. I'm Josh Ose. Uh, I run an internet security research group. We do Let's Encrypt and another project called Prosima related to memory safety, which I may say more about later. Uh, for me, I, I came to this problem from a, a pretty pedestrian angle. Like. I would get these security updates for my phone, and I would look at the vulnerability lists, and all the time it was like buffer overflow, use after free, and you know I'd have to tell my family you got to fix this, and I would deal with this stuff through work. And I think what's so frustrating about this to me is not just the vol the volume, 
but that it's a really solvable problem. I mean, we face a lot of problems in security and competing in general where I'm not really sure what the answer is. It's complicated. I don't know if we have a way out yet. But with memory safety, I feel like for the most part, we do know what the answer is. You know, we, we have options. We do know what the answers are. It is going to be a lot of work to address. Um, but I think problems that are, you know, merely a lot of work, that, that gets me interested. You know, I, I don't want us to continue to suffer from things that we, we have the answer to. So I'm excited for us to get to work, make strategies, and just put in the effort to, to rid ourselves of this problem. Yeah. A lot of work, indeed. Uh, so I want to start really easy, because I know you all are working on very many different aspects of, of memory safety right now. Can you just give us a breakdown about the projects you're working on and how you are tackling this work? I'm happy to start. So uh, two of the big projects I've been working on, one is the Python Cryptographic Authority uh, family of libraries. So we maintain most of the widely used cryptography libraries in the Python ecosystem. And over the last uh, about two years, we've been incorporating Rust into those, um, using it for everything from X509 uh, certificate parsing to the implementation of uh, bcrypt in the cleverly named bcrypt library. And that's been, I think, a, a really successful uh, effort. Uh, a, we've, we've gotten rid of a lot of attack surface, uh, particularly via you know, parsers and, and other things like that that have historically been a big source of vulnerabilities. Uh, we've also been able to improve our code a lot through this effort. So a result of migrating the X509 parser from OpenSSL's C base parser to Rust was a 10x performance improvement. And the reason for this is OpenSSL's X509 uh, parser will like copy every string. So like you've got you know, the name of the domain name a cert's valid for, and like, all right, that gets a fresh allocation, a fresh copy, right? Every string in a certificate. And in Rust, because we had compiler guarantees about the lifetime of variables, we're able to just keep all of those just pointers and lengths into you know, one big allocation. So it's, it's much more efficient. So like not only were we able to get security, that security then turned into performance. Um, another thing I've worked on is uh, the inclusion of Rust uh, in the Linux kernel, but I think Josh is going to want to talk about that. <laughs> you, you got there before I did, so <laughs> go for it. All right. Uh, so as of, uh, I guess, a release ago, maybe, maybe it's two releases at this point, the Linux kernel now includes kind of a skeleton of Rust code for writing drivers in Rust uh, as part of the Linux kernel. So th this is an effort that, believe it or not, got started at uh, PyCon, uh, I guess about five years ago at this point. And we were just kind of abstractly curious if, you know, what it would look like to do this, you know, is the technology viable? And then two or three years ago, uh, big kind of community got interested in this and started really driving it forward, figuring out, okay, what would it look like to write file systems? What about a USB driver? What about Ethernet? And like just really expanding the set of things you can use it for. And now we're kind of doing the hard work of upstreaming all of that into the Linux kernel. And I think probably the most impressive thing that's been done is uh, the Asahi Linux uh, group has built a driver for uh, the Apple Silicon GPUs and it's, and it's all built in Rust. And, uh, the, the like testimonials from them are like, you know, we just built it and like it kind of worked when it compiled. When we uh, scaled it up to run across multiple cores, there were no concurrency bugs. Like that, that it was a re writing this in memory safe language is really enabling for them. Uh, I think you know that's a very positive testimonial to see. Yeah. So I work my. Memory safety work is usually related to a project that Internet Security Research Group called Prosimo. <clears throat> and our goal is to move some of the lower level components of operating systems over to memory safe code. So we're pretty focused on things that are on network boundaries. So TLS, DNL, DNS, NTP, the Linux kernel, things like that. So we have uh, new implementation of NTP server and client in Rust. It's a great piece of software. We're looking forward to getting that out there more. We're investing heavily into the Linux kernel work that Alex and company started. 
So I had nothing to do with starting that, but I'm really excited about it. And through Prosimo, we've been funding the developers working on that. So the primary developer is under contract with us. Um, and there's somebody working on the Rust tool chain as it relates to its ability to work in the kernel that's also working for us. So we're investing heavily in the Linux kernel stuff, hoping to get into some more drivers that might be able to get upstream soon. Like I said, we got this NTP implementation. We're investing really heavily in a TLS library called Russell's. Um, it's a great library. My goal is someday for that to make a pretty big dent in OpenSSL's market share. Um, not because we don't appreciate all the work that they do, but I think we need to move beyond TLS implementations written in C. So Russell's, I think, is our best bet there. We're investing heavily in that. Really excited about the, the velocity of development just in the past few months has really taken off. We spent a couple of years building up the community and the governance around that, getting the funding in place, and now we're just off to the races. So really excited about the progress we're going to make on Russell's this year. Um, we're going to be making some more investments in DNS. I think that's another pretty critical area. So we're trying to get these, these lower level services that almost every system is running and, and move them away from code that's not memory safe. Um, so my work on memory safety has been more on the consumer advocacy side. And so what we did at Consumer Reports was we did a convening where we got everybody that we thought would care about memory safety from education, government, um, civil society, um, the tech community, like just got a lot of different people in the room and, and came up with um, some ideas on what the problems are, what are potential solutions, what are the next steps um, from an advocacy side, like what should, um, what, what do we think should happen next? And then um, we wrote that all up in a report which came out on Monday. Um, hopefully someone will post it to the Slack and that was really, really exciting. Um, and then the next step is to kind of go back to everybody and figure out like, what, what are our next steps based on the ideas that we came up with like, so that we can more effectively advocate for um, companies to take these steps to um, either incorporate, either rewrite in memory safe languages or sandbox or at least come up with a game plan that they can show us that they're addressing this issue, which I see as like a really important consumer advocacy issue. Yeah, and all of that is really important work on the broad ecosystem at many different levels that we really need. Um, Josh, you kind of preempted this because there was like a, you're seeing a lot of developments going really quickly. And I'm curious, like, what is the state of it now versus a few years ago? I know when I uh, started to really dig into memory safety, I was finding info back to 2020, uh, but not further than then. And I'm seeing a lot more information and resources now. Like, what is the state and how has it changed over the last few years? So I gave a talk at Enigma two years ago, and I would characterize kind of the tone of the conversation then as it was still a question of, is it worth it? Like, this is an expensive proposition to think about replacing millions or billions of lines of C and C++. And I mean, I was optimistic, but uh, I think there was a lot of skepticism that that was a valid path to walk down. I think now the question is a lot more around, all right, what are the techniques that you can do to make this effective? It's, it's a question of how, not if. That, that's the biggest change I see. Yeah. Um, Alex, uh, I'm really happy you brought that up. Yell and I were fighting over who would bring up Alex's <laughs> talk from 2021 first, because it was, it was covering memory and safety. And we both watched it. And we were really excited to like drop it in this talk. And then Alex just did it before us. Sorry. Uh, but like the interesting part of that is you talk so much about the stages of grief, like the grief that it's overwhelming, it's too big of a problem, people are scared of it. Like, do you still feel that grief right now? Um, I still think it is the case that doing a migration for a large project has to be an incremental effort. If you, if you approach the problem as I have 10 million lines of C or C++ code and I need to replace all of them, I, I think that's not setting yourself up for success. And that, that almost has nothing to do with memory safety. If you approach any project as like my only deliverable is everything, that's not a winning strategy. So I, I think the hope is that there's now good proofs of concept of what it looks like to do uh, incremental migrations or migrations of individual components. So like Josh talked about uh, their work on Russell's and part of that has been things like, oh, an Apache module for using Russell's for TLS. And 
you know, replacing one Apache module is like a much more practical problem than replacing all of Apache. So for me, that's the source of hope that like we have these proofs of concept, like here's, here's a path you can walk down for doing things incrementally. I think an important part that I like to add on to this incremental approach is one of the things that comes up a lot is, is everybody gonna have to learn a new language? <laughs> and I think the answer to that because of this incremental approach is no. So for example, you know, Russell's is written in Rust, but we built a nice C API for it. So when we talk to, you know, the guy who built the module for Apache, or when we, we, we hired the maintainer of curl to integrate it into curl, neither one of them had to learn Rust. They just take the module, the C API, and they use it like they would any other C library, but it's safer. Uh, I think that's a really important part of this incremental approach is that doing your first module doesn't even necessarily involve learning a new language if you handle it this way. I think it, it's unrealistic to expect everyone to just pick up Rust to get in the game here, and that's really not necessary. Well. So I can speak to what I've heard um, when I became a memory safety evangelist and <laughs> was you know, just showing everybody this memo and this deck that I made. Of, I think it was about a year or two years ago. And at first, people were like, who else is working on this? Um, and there was, you know, um, uh, Fish in a Barrel, there was like Chris Palmer's blog, there was a few, like Atlantic Council wrote something, but there wasn't a lot of super, super high profile names that people had heard of. And they were like, why should I care about this? Um, you know, I, and that's really changing. And it seems like every week or two, there's some new development. And so I feel like we are getting momentum. And there's fewer, like I used to just get different objections and every time I got one, I would add a new slide. <laughs> and I'd be like, here's my response to this and like do a little more research. And I feel like that's happening less now. Um, so just from that, the sort of advocacy side, it does seem like things are kind of slowly changing. I yeah. Three years ago, it's unimaginable. I think that you would have written that report through consumer reports and here we are. Like that's a really important part of strategy, how we're gonna get where we're going. And I'm glad we're at that part of the conversation now. Um, I can attest to hearing Yale's evangelism and being a convert. Uh, <laughs> and then a year ago or so being like, yeah, we, we really do need to do something about memory safety. And what is our plan? And how are we going to bring people together? And what are we going to do? And I think that's a testimony to like, we need different roles and different backgrounds of people jumping into this issue to tackle it from like, whether it is an advocacy side, whether it is building um, new ideas and, and test solutions to incrementally go at it. And so how, how do we do that across the system? We have four of us who are evangelizing up here. We need a lot more. I'm sure we have more in this room, but how do we get out to the broader network of people who can hear these stats, hear this information and get evangelized to move that forward? So for me, what I found that's really effective is that I will tie it to whatever people are most interested in. So if I'm talking to somebody who's like, I care about human rights, I'm like, this is absolutely a human rights issue. This affects journalists. This affects consumer rights. This affects cyber readiness. This affects patient care. Like, whatever issue that they have that I can tie this into, like, will get them more interested. So that's been effective for me. Yeah, I, I think. For me, the thing I have tried and query whether it's been successful, it, but is to try to highlight just how many of the major vulnerabilities we see exploited that are you know, practically name brand have memory safety as a root cause or as, a, as an underlying cause. Everything from Heartbleed to WannaCry, you know, used against NHS hospitals in the UK, to many of the Pegasus exploits to uh, a series of vulnerabilities Google uncovered that were used against uh, indiscriminately Uyghur uh, users of like a popular Uyghur forum. Uh, just like seeing, su surfacing how much below the surface like the headline stories you're seeing actually have a common underlying cause I think can be eye-opening. Yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's a big thing to tackle. Um, and I'm also like really looking, Alex and Josh, at you all for this uh, in terms of the software systems. Like, where where are we finding the biggest challenges today? I know we're thinking about academic institutions, like dis demystifying the like Rust is hard. Uh, there's so many different levels of buy-in that we need. Uh, is it more on the technical side? Is it on the implementation side of pushing this forward? Where do you feel like are the challenges we need to focus our energy? Uh, so the 
biggest challenge I see, or maybe the biggest unaddressed challenge I see, is accomplishing kind of this incremental approach that we talked about requires having often kind of bilingual code bases and uh, build system integration. And I think these are two topics that are like not popular and deserve much more investment in good tooling. Um, particularly, I, you know, I see a lot of breakdown around the edges. If you have a C code base that compiles using MS Build, like the default Visual Studio build system, it's, there's not a well-trod path on like how do you incorporate Rust into that as well. So better paving these paths and better tooling around accomplishing these, these bilingual code bases, I think is the kind of thing that would make these projects much more accessible to more people. I think lots of software engineers, you know, they know multiple programming languages, they're comfortable working in them. Doing this like tool chain stuff is painful and like a much more foreign expertise in my experience. So I think, I think that's an opportunity for rich investment. Yeah, I don't have a better answer than that. I run into the same thing where even, even when we have a piece of software that is really nice memory safe code and you can make a pretty good argument for why someone should adopt that. If you're talking to Linux distributions or other you know, proprietary operating system vendors, um, even if you can s convince them that this is a good idea, there are a lot of challenges around how you start shipping Rust code at all of any kind inside an operating system. And that's not even just an issue of a bilingual code base. Um, if you have a Linux distribution or an operating system that contains a bunch of different programs, shipping your first Rust program or your second or your third in such a way that you have all the same safety checks and sort of like shipping pipeline checks in place, that's tough. Um, operating system vendors are going to have to invest really heavily in that, and it's a big barrier for adoption right now. Yeah, when we think about investment, there's so much conversation around like time, money, energy. Um, and I love like what I ISRG is doing, really like building that ecosystem and helping fund it. Uh, do we need more funding here? Like where, where is the funding coming from? Because we have a lot of tech organizations who are working on the front lines to really push that. But is there like an obligation to the broader ecosystem because we're all impacted by this? And how do, how do we potentially get there? We do need more funding. Um, I think there's a lot more funding out there now than there was last year or three years ago. We do need a lot more, and that's, that's going to be both funding internal ad organizations, especially larger tech companies that are involved in major operating system components and things like that. I think they're going to have to move budgets. Um, we also need more funding in the open source space. Yeah, my, my focus has always been on the open source work that I can do with my own hands, uh, so no funding required for that. I do think the maybe the biggest uh, uh, wins will be when operating system vendors, you know, mobile phones, browsers, uh, incorporate these things into their own development, just because those are big producers of C and C plus plus, right? Like those are the domains that are like the core of how you justify C plus uh, plus. It needs to be close to the hardware. It has these performance constraints and no runtime, right? Like. The, the, those are the places that we see memory safety vulnerabilities exploited. So a, as those types of places start to move, uh, those are, I think, the uh, big wins. And there was uh, the Android security team did a blog post in December detailing some of their work uh, starting to incorporate uh, more Rust and moving away from uh, C and C++. And it, it's particularly impressive because there's a lot of empirical measures of how this really did work. This really did reduce the vulnerability counts. Um, so I, I am hopeful that's the start of a trend. Yeah, if you haven't read this Android blog post, you should. I think that's one of the most important pieces of information to come out in this whole debate. I mean, I talk to a lot of big companies about what their strategy is for moving operating systems and browsers over to safer languages. And that is a data point we've been missing, and it's going to have a huge impact on the industry. Cool. Someone drop that link in the Slack, and if not, we'll get on it after. Um, I talked to someone from an operating system, and they told me about this huge tension that they have, whether it is uh, transferring old code into memory-safe languages, 
or working on new products in memory safe languages. Both of them equally had an abundance of like time and energy and money uh, that's needed to do it and the tension they felt between how do I do both at the same time and do I focus on one over the other? And I'm just curious if you all have a take on if you are facing that dilemma, like which, where do we, where do we put the energy? Do we ensure that everything coming out in the future is memory safe language? Uh, like, is that where we want to go? Or do we really want to go back and change some of this legacy code at a faster speed than like what we're putting out? I like to focus on existing projects. And my thesis there is they already have an install base that mostly updates them regularly, hopefully. And if we incorporate and gradually migrate them to memory safe languages, then there is just a natural uptake process. Um, right. And I think we see lots of really impactful software projects have incredibly long life cycles. Apache is. The HEDBD is, what, 20 years old at this point, if not older? Um, and it doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. Right? Similarly, like Chrome or Windows or iOS, like these are not going anywhere. Um, so while it, it is great to start something new, uh, like I, my, my focus is on what, what are these infrastructural things that are not going anywhere. I think it's easier to make a rule where all your new code is going to be memory safe. So I think from a, from a fiction point of view, that's an easy and a nice rule to make. But in a point that I think is very related to what Alex is saying, there's no reason to believe that your new code is more important from a safety perspective than your old code. So I think you really just need to prioritize by like what are the most critical components here. And I think in most cases, it's going to be components you're already shipping. So I think you just need to have a clear priority list about what is the most important stuff. You know, if you're if your user's biggest exposure to memory safety vulnerabilities is TLS, you should fix your TLS library. Um, it's not a matter of, you know, is it new or is it already shipping or something like that. Yeah, and speaking of rules, like what room do we have for regulation? Like we're talking about also advocacy on memory safety. Um, so do we need a better regulation? Do we need uh, CISOs to make commitments to updating X amount of code in the next few years? Um, what, what is going to push us into that mark? Unofficially, in your point of view, <laughs> Alex. <laughs> uh, my, my point of view is that, uh, speaking only for myself, I think you know, regulations that you must be all memory safe is very, very challenging with you know, the exact point I just made about all these uh, legacy code bases. So like, for the time being, the most important thing is for people who have these very large code bases that are memory unsafe languages to be building out their plans and starting to execute on them. And I think pressure from customers uh, uh, and users of these things is the, is the forcing function there f for me. Um, you know, in, in an abstract sense, uh, more pressure right from a regulatory perspective on uh, secure software practices as a whole is, is a valuable thing. But I, I think this is, is a challenging place where like, there is no snapping your finger and overnight you don't have uh, a lot of C and C++. Like, that's, that's not what this looks like. Yeah. Um, and I also think there's value in holding up some of the great migrations that have happened. I know, Yael, you in the report like, highlighted case studies and been, been talking to many people as to like, where's the success you've had and how does it look? Like, can you talk to any of that? Um, yeah, we highlighted uh, different projects, um, and it was about um, uh, getting rest in the kernel. Um, we talked about um, some of the sandboxing that um, Firefox had done. There was like a, a bunch of different case studies where people explained, um, and I think like the other ones were your. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think one one of them was around like the the performance win I, I talked about with certificate parsing. Um, yeah. I also remember uh, when we held the convening, we had um, organizations that were kind of in this mode where they're like, we're outsourced to get a lot of rust done for companies and really help change that code. But they were struggling on capacity that it was not sustainable for them. Uh, so organizations would like leverage them. But then internally, they were struggling to get more support from um, their staff. And, and they couldn't just forever have these organizations in place building more uh, 
building more safe memory code without the internal support. And I found that really interesting on the dynamics of where we are in the industry, which also really makes me think of ac like the academic institutions. And yeah, you talked about this in the report on the chicken and egg. Uh, I've, we've talked to a few academics uh, who have said, we teach C, C and C++ because it helps people get a job. And it's hard to adjust the curriculum. Uh, and there's so much more that's needed there. And we can't fit in memory safe languages in our, our curriculum for computer science or um, development programs. And it's a really confusing battle as to like how do we get there and how do we work with academic institutions. I know that there are many people here representing some of them. Uh, and so I'm, I'm curious, like how can we work with these communities and the schools in particular to change some of that demystification around what is needed and what tools we're teaching to people? Yeah, and I'm hoping we can get some of them talking, like create a forum where they can talk to each other about it because there are people that have it's a kind of a broad issue and there's different perspectives on it and it really depends on the class but there are some specific classes that are like so full to the brim that if you add another concept like people's heads will explode um, and so like how do you and so like um, yeah they were trying to figure out like how do we incorporate this or what do we do um, but I, there was like actually a lot of debate and back and forth on that because some people are like, well, people do want to hire people who like, can write in memory safe languages. And so um, I feel like that that's going to need more kind of conversation um, for us to figure out. And, uh, and it's kind of individualized, which is kind of going back to the whole regulation issue. I think it's going to be difficult to come up with like this is the one thing everybody should do because it might not be applicable to some people and you can follow certain steps and not actually create and like changes for the end user um so like there's like a lot of like nuance and discussion and thought that needs to go into that to see like make sure like if we put a lot of effort into something like is it actually having that kind of impact that we want yeah and then like for funding, like where is that, fun is, the, is there room to fund um, like different curriculum and academics and help changing this? Do we see a space for that in there as well? I'm not very familiar with the educational funding situation, yeah. so that I don't, I don't know that I have too much to add to that. Yeah, I, I, the reason I'm asking is because there is, conversation around more fellowships, like more student-led, school-based fellowships that really promote integrating this learning. And as we think of memory safety, like it is very layered. There's many places in which we need to tackle this because of the challenges. Um, and so, you know, hearing that you're, you're not familiar is, is makes sense. And I'm wondering if we can like push towards that as part of the challenges that we're facing. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it seems like a nice idea. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, and then I also, I feel like one of the other challenges that's really come up for people is, you know, there's advocates and, and people who are working deep in this like us who are in companies talking about these issues. Uh, and then we really need buy-in of like business executives, like people at, at the top levels of these organizations uh, who are not who are not overwhelmed by the grief, because uh, that is strong, uh, and who feel like they are empowered to do this. And I'm wondering how we can talk about solutions and how to bring those people on board, how people in the room who are now all evangelizers, I'm sure, like you're all converts, you're with us, um, are, are able to go back and talk to these people and actually like work through plans uh, that we understand are not gonna happen immediately, but like in the short, long term, uh, work on building something that makes sense for where they're at. Yeah, I think part of the answer is that an investment in memory safety is essentially an upfront cost to reduce your long-term support costs, right? You will not have to deal with incoming vulnerabilities, which is like an expensive triage process. You will not have as many stability problems, you know, non-security crashes. And part of making that argument that like this is an effective cost benefit is building up the, the body of data that shows, yes, the vulnerability counts really are lower. Yes, we were able to ship this performance improvement uh, due to concurrency more easily and building up that body of case studies that the math works out basically. And that's what I think that the Android uh, blog post does a really effective job of is, is showing the numbers. Is it true that it will cost us less to update memory unsafe code right now as opposed to waiting and doing it later? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, code bases have a tendency to expand, so 
the kind of sooner we start paying down the technical debt, the lower our interest payments will be to overextend a metaphor uh, egregiously. I also think it is the case that there are a lot of benefits that are very hard for us to measure. Uh, I know when I, I used to work on Firefox and you know we get crash reports and it was a non-trivial amount of time spent kind of staring at crash reports being like, I can tell there is a bug in this subsystem, but like memory is so corrupted that you know trying to debug it is like kind of an hours long like staring at a hex dump and praying exercise. And it's not well quantified what the benefits of getting rid of that process will be, but it, it seems inconceivable to me that's not, not a huge win uh, for, you know, for the projects that, that have kind of this robust crash reporting infrastructure and are diligently trying to uh, debug them. Yeah, I think the number of hours that senior browser engineers sink into trying to debug problems that don't happen in Rust is depressing. <laughs> like, these are like really bright, talented people, and you want to imagine that they're out, you know, making your browser better in ways that matter to you. And the fact of the matter is, they're spending huge amounts of their time trying to figure out, you know, some problem that is the result of shared mutable state or something that, you know, just doesn't exist in Rust or a, or a safer language. It's it's a heavy toll, and it's not good for anybody. I, I just keep going back to that 60 to 70 percent number, and I'm like, if that's not convincing, then what is? Like, um, um, I, that's just huge. Like, um, you know, just thinking about personal examples, like, I don't take baths when there's lightning. Like, I don't know. It's like, well, you look at percentages of risk and, like, make changes to behavior based on that. And so, like, I, I don't know. I kind of see it as, like, an expectation for consumers that if you know this thing is causing most of our issues that you would do something about it. And like, I can't speak to the specifics of how each organization should do it um, as well, because there are there is a lot of data I don't have and like a lot of information. But like, like please just get started working on it. I don't know. I feel like the case kind of makes itself. So. Yeah, there is a real business case there. And that's what I find. And when we think about the problem, like it is really challenging because like it's very clear what are the issues and what needs to be done. And I, um, I feel like it's so hard for everyone to get to the solutions. <laughs> uh, so I'm wondering like if there is one solution you zero in on, whether it's through your work or something like that, like where, what would you feel like we can push forward as solutions? I mean, I want to see plans. I want to see, you know, Microsoft and Apple. Like, I want to see these companies tell us what they're going to do. Like, I want to see them, like, no, I'm not expecting everybody to do this overnight, but I want to know that they are thinking about it and working on it incrementally and, like, actually working on it incrementally, not just, like, trying to check off boxes to look like they're working on it incrementally in a way that doesn't actually help anybody. And, like, starting with, um, you know, the most sensitive data, whether that's government data or medical, or PII, whatever it is, like, I want to, like, see that there is a thoughtful process there and that it is on a roadmap, so. Yeah, for me, it is kind of similar. Figure out where the biggest source of risk is, the component that had the most vulnerabilities last year, the most privileged thing, the thing on the network boundary, the thing on the kernel user space boundary, whatever that component is, and Figure out, are there blockers to this, to, to finding a memory safe solution here? And if so, like, how do we just start knocking them down? And I mean, I, I think several of us have talked about Rust a lot, but like, it doesn't have to be Rust. Like, write it in Go, write it in Swift, you know, write it in Java. Like, all these things are fine. Uh, I just tend to talk about Rust because it is usable in the context where historically C felt like it did not have any alternatives. But you know these other languages. You're writing, you're writing a network server. You use Go. You're writing an iOS app. Use Swift. Uh, right? There there are plenty of good choices out there. Yeah, I think my answer is basically the same and probably unsurprising in that it's what my project does is let's find the most important places to get going. Um, I would throw it out there. Focus on network and privilege boundaries. Um, find those components. Make a plan and get to work. Um. I will also say there is, for individuals working on open source projects, there is often, uh, there, there can be quite a bit of leverage, right? If you incorporate Rust into your own project, then your dependencies will kind of need to be okay with that. And that's 
that can be painful. Uh, some folks might have seen, like there's a very large and long issue where various people are upset about our inclusion of Rust into the PyCA cryptography library and the impact it's going to have on AIX machines running PA risk CPUs that have not been produced in a decade. And, like, people are genuinely upset about this and like it's a little mystifying to me, but I, I will say like we ate a fair amount of negative feedback and then we made the ecosystem better. It's now possible to ship pre-built artifacts for Alpine Linux, for example, in a way that really reduced the pain of using Rust um, for a Python extension module. And it was the case when we shipped our second module written in Rust, there was kind of no negative feedback to that because the ecosystem had smoothed itself out. By, so by being willing to accept a certain amount of uh, pain the first time, it's not much easier for any future project that wants to incorporate Rust. So if, if you are a project kind of in that position of having a lot of use, you know, tons of downstreams, and you're, you're willing to accept uh, some negative feedback and, and put in the work to improve your ecosystem, that, that can be a really high leverage position. But a challenging one to take on. <laughs> uh, yeah, like I can't say it's fun to have like yeah. the message board threads like asking what is wrong with you and you broke my PA risk uh, build and like all of that. And like th there are also people with far more reasonable concerns than PA risk. Uh, like I, I don't want to say everyone had like uh, ridiculous complaints. There, there were plenty of people with reasonable uh, complaints, but uh, having done that, it, it seems to have worked out well. We can see from the download metrics, the vast majority of users have upgraded to versions that incorporate Rust code. So like, it, it seems to be working. Yeah, I feel like when you're on, reading about memory safety online, like there's a whole slew of people who are like, I couldn't do this because of these issues, and um, I'm in different stages of this grief on your video. Uh, there's, there's so many different versions of where people are at, and I, I feel like with that challenge, like where, where are people, where is the community to support? Like can they go to Prasmo and find support through avenues there? Like where are places where we can support these projects and people doing this work? I don't have a great answer in terms of like a, an organized community of, of folks who have you know, done similar things, whether it's the kernel or GStreamer, which incorporates Rust code now, or RSVG. Like, I don't know that there's an organized community that uh, is like a place you can post your, the challenge you're having, but there, there's definitely a growing body of expertise out there. Uh -huh. Yeah, it really depends on what you're working on. Um, I feel like we've shared various resources, uh, whether it's the Android blog or the report, uh, and we will definitely equip everyone with that. But like, are there other resources people can point to and go through that are more helpful? Because I do find that there's um, a small ecosystem of resources, uh, but sometimes they can be really helpful to read through. Alex's blog, I'll, I'll start. Alex's blog has been really helpful. Uh, last year, uh, Paul Kerr, my, my co-maintainer and myself, gave a talk at uh, PyCon on the experience we had. And while it's, it's kind of specific to that ecosystem, we do kind of walk through what is all the things we ended up doing to uh, make that ecosystem kind of m more compatible for the next person who wants to ship Rust. So I, I think that's a, a good resource on what it looks like to kind of make those investments and make it easier for the next person. Uh, I can say at the end of the report, there's a very long list of resources. Um, and a lot of it is kind of talking about the problem more than solutions, but there's also like a lot of background knowledge. And, uh, and depending on what people are looking for, they may find something there. And you have to say memorysafety.org. Yeah, check out memorysafety.org. <laughs> I mean, our, our remit is not to change all the C code in the world. We're really pretty focused on the most critical systems level components, but I think there's a lot of information there in the blog posts, and uh, hopefully there'll be even more as our projects reach maturity and get more adoption. Yeah. Um, those are really helpful resources that we will share. Um, thank you to our panelists, uh, and thank you all for the questions. That was really robust, and we will get on the Slack after to answer more. Awesome. Thank you so, so much. Thank you all. Thank you.